on behalf of the McLean Center um, and, and Dr. Meltzer's Center for Health and the Social Sciences and the Buxbaum Institute, it's a delight to welcome you to today's lecture in the 2019-2020 series on the present and future of the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, I am delighted to introduce you to Professor Daniel Brudney, who will be our speaker today. Um, Dan Brudney is the Florin Harrison Pugh Professor in the Department of Philosophy and in the college. Uh, after receiving his, PA, his bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard, he later received his PhD in philosophy also from Harvard. And then Dan joined the faculty here at the University of Chicago in philosophy and in the college, as well as in the Divinity School. Um, during his years here at the university, uh, Dan joined the McLean Center um, as a faculty member, uh, if I have this right, Dan, in 2004. Yeah, a couple of years back. Uh, here at the university, uh, Professor Brudney writes and teaches political philosophy, bioethics, philosophy and literature, and philosophy of religion. Dan's research interests include uh, patient autonomy, uh, ethics of liver transplantation, uh, the conscientious refusal on the part of healthcare professionals and conflicting interests in clinical decision making. Dan has been the recipient of many awards, including the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, one of uh, our university's oldest prizes. Uh, Dan's talk today is entitled Three Philosophical Questions at the Bedside. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Dan Brudney, but also on congratulating him on his appointment as the Florin Harrison Pugh Professor. Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's good to see you all here. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to you. Um, what I want to do today is just to motivate some conversation about philosophical issues that I think are, um, you guys are all in the back, so I'm going to have to use the mic. If you just came down, it would be easier. Um, issues that I think are embedded in clinical practice um, and that, you know, you all uh, are constantly making these decisions and you may not be aware that they're philosophically contentful and robust. And I just want to bring out the philosophical issues at stake in them and then in three places ask you what you think, where you think, um, the, why you think the right thing to do is what you think it is, what sorts of philosophical commitments you're willing to take on. So I'm going to start for my first question by looking at three cases of refusal of treatment. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Oh, look at that. I did it right. Um, this is a case from um, uh, the Siegler, Johnson, and Winslade classic book on clinical medical ethics. Um, it's from the sixth edition, I think. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole slide because there's too much there. But the basic idea is that you have um, a graduate student brought to the emergency room um, complaining of a severe headache and stiff neck. Um, Ultimately, it's this, it, um, his diagnosis is bacterial meningitis. Um, when told his diagnosis and that he'd be admitted to the hospital for treatment with antibiotics, he refused further care without giving a reason. He would not engage in discussion with the staff about his refusal. The physician explained the extreme dangers of going untreated and the minimal risk of treatment. The young man persisted in his refusal and declined to discuss the matter further. Other than this strained adamancy, he exhibited no evidence of mental derangement or altered mental status that would suggest decisional incapacity. And let's just stipulate, it's not in the example, but let's just say he really, really dislikes injections. And that's what's motivating him. That's our first case. Come on now. Second case. This is a 56-year-old devout Jehovah's Witness. She's read broadly and thought deeply about and believes profoundly in witness theology. She's lived her life in accordance with witness precepts, and she's a, she sees a substantial 
part of the meaning and value of her life as tied up with her witness identity, and so with adherence to the requirements of that identity. She needs a major operation in order to survive, but the operation can't be done without the use of the kind of blood products that her witness theology proscribes. So she's refused the operation. So then, a third case. This is an 86-year-old man, terminally ill, likely to die within two months. He's a breathing tube dependent. He's also in considerable pain that can be relieved only by sedation that deprives him of consciousness. After a great deal of reflection, as well as discussion with family, friends, and a spiritual counselor, he's decided to have the breathing tube removed. I want to use these cases to point to the need, as I say, for philosophical thought at the bedside. I don't mean that doctors are going to do what philosophers do, extract concepts, make fine-grained distinctions, see if arguments are valid and sound, and so forth. I mean merely that bedside decisions are often made on the basis of fundamental philosophical views. Aristotle recounts the following tale from the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus. This is from Aristotle on Heraclitus. When the strangers who came to visit him found him warming himself at the furnace in the kitchen and hesitated to go in, Heraclitus is reported to have bidden them not to be afraid to enter, as even in that kitchen divinities were present. Heraclitus' point and Socrates' point in doing his philosophical work in the marketplace um, is that philosophy is often part of ordinary life. Now, I'm not going to be arguing for or against any specific way of doing clinical practice. As I say, I just want to try to identify the philosophical commitments that one takes on when one believes that at the bedside one ought to do things this way rather than that. So these first three cases, and there'll be a fourth one eventually, are all cases of refusals of treatment. In modern American medical practice, a central moral and not merely legal feature is that a patient with what's called decisional capacity, as you all know, may refuse medical treatment, including life-saving treatment. And treatment may be refused for what might seem to be foolish reasons, and even when treatment would prolong a good life. So why do we do this? Why do we let patients decide? There's more than one reason why we do so, and it may be that in the end, the reason we do so, the reason we have this rule, is based on a, co um, um, a combination of multiple factors. Uh, but a thing that's often talked about is this thing called patient autonomy. As with many philosophical concepts, autonomy is susceptible of multiple interpretations. Philosophers would, so, would say about it that there is the concept of autonomy, and then there are various conceptions of that concept, or interpretations of the concept. Philosopher Joel Feinberg has identified, I think it's 13 distinct conceptions of autonomy. I may have miscounted. Maybe it's 12, maybe it's 14. Other philosophers have counted more. I'm just going to look at four conceptions of autonomy. My initial claim is that, at least in some hard cases at the bedside, the doctor is making a philosophical decision about which conception or conceptions of autonomy, singly or jointly, are supposed to be applied. I want to lead up to the first three conceptions of autonomy by proposing the following hypothesis about what I take to be fairly common reactions to our first three cases. I suspect that clinicians find patients like our graduate student to be deeply frustrating. I sometimes ask the clinicians that I teach whether it would be morally acceptable to inject the student against his will. Most say no, but some say yes. Um, you know, there he is, he's dozing, you've got the syringe, um, he'll never even feel it. Should you give him an injection, save his life? As I say, most clinicians I teach say, no, that would be wrong, and the question is why. But a few actually think the right thing to do would be to do so, but even they are bothered by it. So that suggests that there's still something morally going on here. Um, I want here, just to digress, not to let you fight the example. Um, when philosophers give examples, non-philosophers often want to fight them. Uh, and in this case, the way you'd fight the example would be by denying that um, the graduate student has decisional capacity. Um, I don't want to go there for two reasons. One, 
to get into that would get us into a very vexed question, namely about whether the decisional capacity standard on its best reading has morally contentful content in specifying what accounts to be sufficiently rational to make a decision. But I also don't want to get there because you don't need to. I'm sure in all, all of you in your clinical practice um, have had patients whom you do believe had decisional capacity and whom you also believed were refusing treatment for what you were very confident was a foolish reason. So, wow. 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 oh, really? All right. Um, uh, is this better? All right. So I just have to be closer to the mic. Um, so uh, most clinicians find the first case troubling, even if they think the right thing to do is to let this graduate student alone and let him die. I think clinicians are more at ease with the case of the Jehovah's Witness. Um, my, lost track of my slides, um, uh, and they might, you know, not think that this is what they would do, um, but they feel that somehow the witness's decision, fitting as it does with her fundamental convictions, um, in some way makes it proper to let her go. And clinicians tend to find the third case of the elderly man who's terminally ill um, particularly an easy case, even if they would not themselves, um, in the, were they in that situation, make this decision, they think it fits within the bounds of what's reasonable. Um, so I want to tie these three cases to three conceptions of autonomy. So here's conception one. Autonomy involves not having um, one's actions interfered with in the pursuit of one's desires. If nobody interferes with one's opting, say, for coffee over tea, autonomy obtains. Here now is conception two. It's going to be conception one plus um, having one's uninterfered with actions be the expression of a relatively coherent and at least to some extent reflectively endorsed set of beliefs and values. Uh, the philosopher Gerald Dworkin has given a useful characterization of conception two. Dworkin writes, autonomy is conceived of as a second order capacity of persons to reflect critically upon their first order preferences, desires, wishes, and so forth, and the capacity to accept or attempt to change these in light of higher order preferences and values. By exercising such a capacity, persons define their nature, give meaning and coherence to their lives, and take responsibility for the kind of person they are. Finally, a third conception, that's conception two, with the addition that one's beliefs are for the most part true and one's values for the most part defensible. So it's conception two plus getting things sufficiently right. Now, each of these conceptions has had its adherents and distract, um, detractors. Um, conception one is sometimes the sort of thing one finds among social scientists who tend to think that to be autonomous really is just to pursue your desires. Philosophers generally don't go there, um, and that's because philosophers don't generally think that desires are all just on their own or all that big a deal. Um, Dan Brock has pointed out that a desire can be transient, can be arbitrary, can be trivial. Um, there's little reason for anyone to do or to refrain from doing anything simply because I desire it. As it happens, especially at this time of day, I have a great desire for a big slab of chocolate cake. But I don't think that it, this provides anyone with a reason to give me one. Of course, if I've exercised my will, to buy a slab of cake, it might be wrong to interfere with my doing so. I'll get to why in just a minute. But the value of my desire simply as a desire and not as actually enacted by my will is tied for the most part to its content. My desire for world peace is a desire for something intrinsically good. The goodness of the content is what gives everyone a reason to try to satisfy this desire, not the fact that I have it. If autonomy is to have substantial moral weight, it must be tracking something more significant than a mere desire. 
Now, by contrast to conception one, conception two has a very distinguished philosophical lineage. This conception highlights the value of individuality. It's favored by John Stuart Mill and many others. It's sometimes talked of in terms of pursuing one's real self or one's authentic self. Um, don't let the talk from Gerald Dworkin of higher order decisions confuse you. All Dworkin's pointing to is that when we figure out our plan of life, and few of us figure out a whole plan, but we don't do things without some sense of continuity, it's because um, whether consciously or unconsciously, to a great extent or only a little bit, we've actually thought about whether the things we wish to do are worth the doing. Um, they're not random desires and random choices. They're rather, as philosophers would say, things that we endorse. So this thought that um, it's important to lead a life in accordance with your own beliefs and desires is a thing that many people have thought. In fact, it's a widespread modern view. You find it in all sorts of places, in Ralph Waldo Emerson's encomium on self-reliance, and in every cloying Hollywood film that says that you have to be yourself. As for the detractors of conception too, they point out that as an ideal of life, it's a formal ideal. In principle, one could be true to one's authentic self foolishly or wickedly. One's authentic self could be based on false beliefs or wicked values. Um, imagine Hans. Hans is an utterly unreflective Nazi. He's a Nazi because that's what everyone in his environment is doing. Um, he hasn't thought about being a Nazi much. He just parrots the phrases. By contrast, Gunther is a Nazi who's really thought about it all. He's taken a lot of time to think about what the Nazis believe, and on due reflection, he's endorsed it all. It's not unintelligible, at least, to think that actually Gunther's life is worse for the fact that he has reflectively endorsed his false and wicked beliefs um, compared to Hans, who's just parroting them. The point here is, that although in general one might think that part of a good life is to lead it in accordance with your own beliefs and values, it's at least open to question whether um, it's necessarily better um, to do so um, or whether there is at least some degree in which it's important that the content of your beliefs actually track the true and the good. And that's the considerations that lead philosophers like Susan Wolfe um, to say that the importance of autonomy is precisely in being able to form one's values on the basis of what is true and good, not merely on the basis of what one thinks is true and good. Another fine philosopher, Joseph Rods, favors a life that is indeed one's own and that meets standards of the good. He says that autonomy is valuable only if exercised in pursuit of the good, not merely what one thinks is good. Now, what I want you to see about these three conceptions is that they're all about what it is good for the person who acts. On these three conceptions, the value of autonomy is either in its tendency to facilitate the pursuit of one's desires, or in its tendency to facilitate a life lived according to one's sincerely held beliefs and values, that's conception two, or in its tendency to facilitate a life according, held, lived according to one's beliefs and values where those beliefs are sufficiently true and the values sufficiently good. For all of these conceptions, the point or value of autonomy is in its relation to what is good for the patient. None of them talks about the patient's moral right to make the treatment decision. So it's important that you see this, that the, there are conceptions of autonomy that are not tied um, intrinsically to the thought of a moral right, but that are tied intrinsically to the thought that a certain picture of what it is to lead a life is better for a person. Um, now, there is, however, another conception of autonomy that focuses on the idea that one has a right to make certain decisions. Um, I'm going to link this to the work of Immanuel Kant, but in fact not to his own discussion of autonomy in the, his book, The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, published in 1785. Um, so far as I know, Kant was the first writer to use the term autonomy to refer to individuals or to actions of individuals. Um, 
To be autonomous is just in terms of the meaning of the words, to give oneself uh, laws. The term was originally applied to political entities. For instance, the Italian city-states of the Renaissance. Florence was autonomous because it gave itself its laws. It was not subject to the laws of Milan or Rome. When Kant introduces the term autonomy in the groundwork, it is to describe an individual who acts on the basis of a law that she gives to herself purely as a rational being. For Kant, the only such law is the moral law, and it has nothing to do with the pursuit of one's desires, or rather it's a constraint on such things. Um, and so his use of the term autonomy, Kant's use, is actually rather at odds with its use in medical contexts. So that's just one of the interesting vagaries of intellectual history, um, that although the term goes back to Kant, its use in medical context does not track his use of it. But there's another place in Kant's writings where I think one can find something that is relevant to medical context. This is his stress on end setting in a work published a dozen years after the groundwork, so in 1797, the work The Metaphysics of Morals. In this later text, Kant writes that what separates humanity from animality, what he calls menschheit from tierheit, is our capacity to make a choice. That is, to exercise one's will, or as he puts it, to set ends. For Kant, there is a moral standard for when one person may interfere with the exercise of another's will. Any interference must be in accordance with the law that all could affirm. Kantians are likely to claim that to exercise compulsion to, pro to promote another's good, in our cases to extend a person's life, does not fit with the law that all could affirm. Kantians are likely to consider it wrong for forcibly to inject our graduate student or to compel treatment in the other cases. I want to be clear, for those of you who know your Kant, that in contrast to his groundwork discussion, Kant's concern here is not the proper motive for morally worthy action, but rather the conditions under which, regardless of motive, it is permissible for one human being to interfere with another's will. To the Kantian, what is crucial in these cases is not the attainment of the good life, but the condition of not being dominated. Now, you don't have to be a Kantian to see something morally important about the condition of not being dominated. Joel Feinberg claims that one has the sovereign authority to govern oneself, that one has a sovereign personal domain over which one is entitled to absolute control. Uh, and this is a very, very ordinary thought. It's simply the thought, you're not the boss of me. On this fourth conception of autonomy, Patients should be the ones to make medical decisions because they are persons. They are agents, they have a will, and agents have a strong moral right not to have their will overridden. One might add to this as a kind of a corollary that it's normally wrong to interfere with a person's body without that person's consent. So our fourth conception is patients should be on the ones to make medical decisions I'm sorry, the fourth conception is that to be autonomous is to have a moral right to make decisions about one's own life. Now, if you believe in general that patients should make their own medical decisions, one major reason might be that you believe that it's normally wrong to interfere with a person's agency and bodily integrity. That sounds sensible. Where the rubber meets the road is when you have to decide how much value there is in agency and bodily integrity. Are these, value, are these always more valuable than prolonging human right? Two philosophers, um, Richard Ann Arneson and Joel Feinberg, disagree. Here's Arneson. In a particular case, the good of the individual that's at stake can be enormous, and the degree to which paternalistic interference would frustrate the, the agent's interest in self-determination can be very slight. Voluntary choice is important, but does not plausibly have make or break significance. Even taking into account the crucial value of autonomy, I think Arneson has conception four in mind, it remains the case that sometimes a hard, coercive shove away from the bad can improve anyone's life. So it looks as if Arneson would think it right to inject the graduate student, the hard shove, and so to, shave, to save his life. Feinberg says no. The life that a person threatens by his own rashness is, after all, his life. It belongs to him and to no one else. 
For that reason alone, he must be the one to decide, for better or worse, what's to be done with it in that private realm where the interests of others are not, pure, are not directly involved. This is the interpretation that follows from what he calls a pure conception of individual sovereign autonomy. A graduate student's refusal might be rash, but Feinberg thinks he has a right to refuse. So the first question I want to just have you discuss is which conception or conceptions of autonomy do we need to accept, and how, must, how far must we weight the value of these conceptions to be able to conclude, if we do conclude, that it's always right to let patients with decisional capacity make the medical decision. So that's going to be question one. So now, discuss. I take it that most of you, maybe all of you, do think that the rule that we have, that a patient with decisional capacity ought to be allowed to make the treatment decision, including refusing life-saving treatment, is the right rule. Or maybe some of you think it's not always the right rule. My question here is there are various ways of thinking of the different moral considerations at stake. You could put heavy weight simply on the value of letting people do what they want because somehow you think that's part of a good life is to do what you want. You could put the weight on not just doing what you happen to want, but rather on doing those things that fit with your general picture of what a good life would be. That's this thought of authenticity. Or you could be like someone like Susan Wolf or Joseph Ross and say, well, wait a second. The real value is in doing what you think is the best life to live when you've got it sufficiently right, when you're not like Gunther, our very reflective Nazi, who simply gets it all wrong. Or you could say none of that matters. What's really going on is this last conception, conception four, the thought that agents have a will and that it is just plain wrong to violate somebody's agency. This is what is very important about a human being, unlike animals. Animals have desires, but they don't have, in Kant's terms, a will. Or you can think it's a combination. And maybe it is. Maybe that's the best answer. The justification for an institutional rule needn't rely on any one thought. It could rely on multiple thoughts. But the philosopher's job is to ask, what's going on? And in particular, we will move soon to noting a place where whether you think conception three is the way to go, or where conception two is the way to go, or conception three, pursuing an ideal, or pursuing an ideal that's right, will have an impact on how you think the doctor-patient conversation should go. But I'm curious. Come on. Go ahead. Gotta be true and good. Yeah. Gotta be true and good. Good. Conception three. Yeah, conception. I think a lot of times when we encounter uh, this tension in the case conference, like in part, the your conception of autonomy depends on how serious the consequences of the medical decision being made are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you see people moving through these, these different conceptions and invoking them. If it's you don't want a blood draw because it hurts but you're a stable patient, you've had stable labs, and that's the ethical question. Well, conception one is probably okay. But the life and death, question, death questions often, I think, lead to people to really want the patient to describe and reflect and have values consistent mm -hmm. with the decision that they're making, or more importantly, the decision that the physician thinks they should properly make. That's conception two. Uh, and that, well, that the physician thinks they should be making would probably be conception, conception three. Others? Javad. It seems to me that uh, autonomy is a relative and social thing. It's in our relation with each other. <clears throat> An example, a patient or a person has the autonomy, say, to jump out of the window. If he wants to do it and he is rational and John Stuart Mill says, well, if you found out that he is rational, 
doctor confirmed him that he has right. However, if I am a doctor and he is sitting in my office, he cannot do that in my office. He cannot jump out of the window through my office because now his autonomy affects me. A pilot has the autonomy to commit suicide, but not why he is flying me. So it all depends what autonomy of one person affects another. So that's a wonderful question, and since you've mentioned John Stuart Mill, I will put this in the terms that Mill uses um, in his book on liberty, in which he asserts what he calls the, the, the principle that um, a person's liberty should not be infringed upon for his own good, but only um, to prevent harm to others. The question then is, what counts as the relevant kind of harm? In the case you're imagining in your office, um, Mill might agree with you that it would be wrong for the patient to jump out of the window of your office because that would traumatize you. And he might have an obligation not to traumatize you. At the bedside, we don't usually say that. Maybe we should. But when someone proposes to refuse tr life-saving treatment, we don't say, oh, you've got two children who depend upon your income. You, we won't let you do that. Um, whether we should talk to the person about that is a question I will get to. But in terms of whether we forbid someone from doing that and compel treatment in order to preserve um, interests that are causally connected to the patient, maybe we should do that, but we don't do that. And that's why, in thinking about these conceptions of autonomy, I have not brought in ways of thinking about it such that it's intrinsically tied to someone else's good. Um, that would be a radical departure from our practices. Maybe a, a one we could talk about, but that would be another talk. David. Uh, that may be another talk, but I, I want to keep going on that theme a little bit. So I'm on service right now, and you know, of course, we've, we've had patients who had preferences about their care that surprise us and are different. And one of the biggest consequences of that when it happens is that it takes a great deal of time. <laughs> and, and, and when it takes a great deal of time, that has consequences for everyone else we care for. Um, and it has consequences, that, uh, sometimes the clinician feels like jumping out the window. Oh, no. Other times the, the other patients don't get hurt. So, so I, it's just an interesting mm -hmm. angle. That is a reality of the constrained world that we live in. Um, that there are these connections between the, the people's preferences and the welfare of a whole bunch of others, both those who have willingly chosen to be clinicians and those who have unwillingly happened or un unvoluntarily happened to be just affected by this person as an external act. So, what you're proposing. Whenever we bring this up, up the concept of rationing in case conference, Mark immediately gets upset and says, we don't do that here. Now, I disagree as to whether in practice we do, but in this case, what you are proposing is time rationing. I'm not, and, 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 I'm not making a proposal. I'm describing a budget constraint. <laughs> <laughs> and that the budget constraint is real. And, and therefore, when you think about the practicalities of how all these things play out, once you have an awareness of it. Now, and the question is going to be, does that, is that awareness, does that bring in something of sufficient moral weight that rather than chatting with our graduate student and trying to persuade him to accept a life-saving injection, you say, hey, look at that squirrel, and then you give him a jab. <laughs> and then we're done. <laughs> so, well, that would be another way to save time. That's true. <laughs> other, th other thoughts? Micah wants to jump back in? I thought God was going to make the, the comment that conception three is uh, the right one because when I go to see Dr. Siegler because I don't feel well and I ask him, and why I don't feel well and what I should do. I'm engaging him, um, and therefore, like, if I go against what I've asked him, 
then I should have some higher order thinking about that uh, to, to argue what is really true and good, separate from what he has recommended. And if he is utterly convinced that you've gotten it wrong, then he should still let you get it wrong. He should not let you get it wrong. He should not let you get it wrong. He should compel treatment? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if even Mark wants to go quite there. <laughs> well, if we, if we go back to the first case. Um, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. If we go back to the first case, which, which is sort of reflected a little bit in, in this question one. Um, we, we did, in that first case, in the emergency room, bring in uh, both psychiatrists and legal people to assess the decisional capacity of this 25, 26-year-old graduate student. Uh, and both, both of the people we consulted um, agreed, as, as you pointed out, that the patient had, as is indicated here in the next to last line, decisional capacity. Um, uh, very smart, very bright, um, and yet there were those of us who were looking after the young man um, who had seen a, a dramatic change from the way he presented to the emergency room and allowed evaluations and blood tests and even a spinal tap to be done, and a sudden, sudden change in his attitude and behavior around the point of treatment, which was, as we said, admission and, and fairly simple antibiotics. Um, so there were those of us who were unsettled about the next to last line on decisional capacity. And of course, as you know, there is no gold standard to, to assess decisional capacity. There's no definitive test that says it exists or is lacking. And working from that perspective, we treated the young man against his wishes, uh, that, that, that first case. So and, conception uh, three. What? So conception three. So conception three. And, and two, or three days, two or three days later, when he had begun to recover from his, um, from his bacterial meningitis, he began to explain to us that our decision had been right. That, that he, had, he had a fundamental fear within the family about antibiotics. His, several of the family members had, had had allergic reactions. One of them was life-threatening. And he couldn't express any of that. He, he didn't quite have his, his mental capacities or his decisional capacity at the time. So, um, so that, that first case was a tough one. Well, but now you're doing what I asked you guys not to do, what doctors always do. You're fighting the example. <laughs> um, because you, you managed to handle this by assuming a way of, you know, eliminating a basic premise of the example, namely that there is decisional capacity. Um, so the, the philosophical question, of course, arises only if you accept the premise that there's decisional capacity. I mean, I, I mean, in most cases, there is decisional capacity. But you, your thought was that although it looked like it, it really wasn't there, and that's what warranted compelled treatment. I want to know what would you have done if you've been forced to conclude, oh, f full capacity, no problem with capacity, just a loony preference ranking, right? Uh, no antibiotics for, is my first order preference, my highest ranking preference, prolonged life is my second. I think, uh, I, I, I think you, you can see to the autonomous right of individuals to make decisions, uh, even if, in your view, the decisions are tragic. And that suggests that it's conception four that is the one that's doing the moral work here. All right, I'm going to now move us on. But can I ask my question, which, which is the most troubling of your slides? Mm -hmm. I'm sure other people were not troubled by it, but it, it troubled me. Mm -hmm. That was a slide of the chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you remember the chocolate cake slide? And, and here's my question for you. The, the chocolate cake slide was something that you wanted mm -hmm. um, at noon because you were ready for chocolate cake. And, and by the way, 
my, my question about autonomy um, and, and where it exists in, in, in the practical world is whether autonomy is most powerful in declining proposals or in, or in initiating requests and demands for what you prefer, like the chocolate cake. I'll stop. So autonomy and everything else is most important when it's a matter of chocolate cake. That's clear. <laughs> but um, what's at stake here is a distinction between thinking of why we let people choose in terms of believing that letting them choose is good for them. And that could mean because we think it's good simply to have your desire satisfied. And of course, many of our desires are good for us. Maybe not chocolate cake, but many of the things that we desire do track what's good for us. But many of the things we desire tr do not track what's good for us. Um, and it's well known we're not often all that good at making our own choices about what's good for us. So you might think that what you're really after is not just the business of desire satisfaction, but the business of having a life that has a certain kind of structure. And the witness case is the one of someone whose life is organized around a set of beliefs. And a major reason one might think for allowing the witness to refuse life-sustaining treatment is that it would undermine the integrity of her life. It would not be unintelligible to say that her life as a whole would actually be worse if it is prolonged while violating the integrity of her life than if it's a shorter life but one that fits with her beliefs and her desires. That's the sort of thing that someone like John Stuart Mill in chapter three of his book on liberty might be tempted to say. That's what I'm calling conception two. This is independent from, the, from, from either from the claim, quite apart from questions of her desires, quite apart from whether um, she has um, a picture of her life that she's adhering to, she has a moral right not to have her will overborne. That's conception four. It's also not independent from, but not the same as the thought that a good life is one lived in accordance not only with beliefs and desires that you think about and make your own and make in the jargon authentic, but that, as Michael wants, in some sense track what's true and good in the world. Um, and all I'm trying to explore is which of these ways of thinking about what's good and the one way of thinking about what's right, a different moral notion, are really at stake when we think the correct thing to do, the correct rule to have, is to let people refuse treatment. David, I'm going to, maybe your question will come again, up again when I move on to the next set of topics, or to the next topic. Um, with the next topic, the focus is not on whether to allow someone to refuse treatment. We're going to assume that that's in place. It shifts to shared decision making. And here I want another case, um, whoop, patient four. Um, this comes from an old article by Julian Savilescu, a patient with breast cancer, um, refuses the surgery that at the time, this was the early 1990s, clearly held then the best chance for survival. Her reason for refusal is that she thinks the surgery will make her unattractive to her husband. Her oncologist is upset by this decision and urges her to reconsider. Um, now, to see what's going on here, I want to give an account of what I'm going to call the elements of practical reasoning. Um, one of my philosophical colleagues is in the audience. I hope he's not offended by um, how quick and dirty this description is. Um, I'm going to isolate just three elements of practical reasoning. Instrumental reasoning, what might be thought of as means ends reasoning. Um, reasoning about the various parts of a given end or goal and how they fit together. This could be called values clarification. And finally, reasoning about the proper goal or goals to have, reasoning about What's good? Um, do not think that the last is something highfalutin. You do it all the time. Um, some of you are clearly old enough to 
have raised or be raising children. So you're making choices about schools. You're deciding soccer versus basketball versus violin versus ballet and so on and so forth. All of those are decisions about what you think is good for your child. We're constantly making decisions about, what the, about the good all the time. It's an ordinary part of ordinary life. Now, when we ask about the patient-doctor conversation, it's clear that element one, the means end reasoning, is in play. Um, the physician presumably knows um, what means are likely to lead to what end. Um, it's probable that values clarification is also in play. You want to get a sense of what the patient really wants, and sometimes the patient will want both A and not A, or want A and B, but B entails not A. Um, and then so you're puzzled, and you try to get the patient to think through what she wants. My question is, is it part of the doctor-patient conversation to think not about what the patient believes is good, not about simply what she says are her goals of care, but about what's good, what the right goals of care should be for her. In the Savulescu case, um, Savulescu thinks that it would have been appropriate for the oncologist to push back against the values that the patient was articulating. The patient was buying into um, a very conventional and probably quite pernicious notion of female attractiveness. And she was deciding that was more important than the likelihood of a longer life. And one might think that it's part of the oncologist's job to say, really? Don't we want to question those values? And if she says, well, my husband might not like me as much if I have the surgery, what's wrong with saying, I know this counselor who can help you think about whether you should get another husband? <laughs> well, no, I'm serious here. Because, and it's interesting, I've now, it turns out, been listening to case conference for 15 years. And what I hear often is a description of a patient-doctor interaction in which the doctor thinks that the patient's values are in some way profoundly problematic. The doctor has a vision of what's good for the patient that's at odds with what the patient thinks, given the patient's values. And what I hear often is a description of how the doctor has talked to the patient in terms that the doctor says are really about values clarification, but aren't. When you're listening, what the doctor is trying to do is to change the patient's values. And my thought here is, if you think that's the right thing to do, sin boldly. And so my question is, now that we have, after all, values clarification fits with conception two of autonomy, with the thought that it's a good life is one in which you've figured out what you want, you've reflected on it, you've thought it through, and we're not going to make any assessment of whether you've gotten it right or not, but it just has a certain kind of coherence and meaning to you. That's conception two. Conception three is that plus, and by the way, you've got it sufficiently right. And now what I want to know from you clinicians is, do you think it's wrong, or do you think it's right, obligatory perhaps, in your conversations with patients, not only to find out what they want, not only to help them clarify what they want, but at least at times to push back against their values and in fact say what you want is a bad idea, meaning it's not, literally, it's not part of your good. It's not good for you, but where that means you have a view of what's good for the patient that they at that moment might not have. So now, that's question two. I totally agree with you, and I think this is where physicians with us teaching autonomy the way we teach it are not allowing that to happen. I don't think we're asking the patient the right questions, like what are your goals in life? 
So in the case that comes from Savalesky of the woman who doesn't want surgery, right. would you, as the doctor, try to wrestle with her about that? I would Obviously, try to the choice is in the end hers. Yeah, I would but totally try to wrestle with her about that. Like, you know, is your physical appearance that important? You know, I mean, have you talked to your husband about is the physical appearance the be all and all in this relationship? Because I think we all feel like we have expectations of our loved ones, and our loved ones have expectations of us, but I don't know that we really deal with those in a realistic manner that maybe we can explore more. Now, I tend to agree with you, but it's important to see the door that has just been opened. One of the reasons for rejecting the old paternalist model was that the paternalist model takes as among its various premises the thought that the doctor is a person of practical wisdom. And as Veach has argued and as others have argued, there's no particular reason to think that mere medical training makes anyone wiser than anybody else. And yet to push back against the patient's values, say in the Savalescu case, implicitly means you think you are wiser than this patient about this particular issue at hand. But and it so, also mean that we, need to, we just need to ask them questions. We, you know, I mean, when he pushed back and said, we want chemo, the <coughs> pathologist was willing to get chemo. Okay. Yeah. And so fundamentally, in her case, if she said, you know, yes, my husband is going to run away with another woman if I have this surgery, then okay, she can make the more decision. Yes. I think what also matters here is that you have hopefully a somewhat personal relationship with the patient. And the patient values that. So going to a computer that will do everything based on the ethical principles and, and defending patient autonomy, I don't think would be the same experience for the patient as having a physician who cares, who can maybe feel what she's feeling and is able to address her on a human level, not even just the expert level. I think that makes a difference in how she go about making this. So you would think it proper to say to this woman, maybe you should get another husband. Or in any event, let, you know, let me give you some literature about this conventional view of female attractiveness and the way um, it's quite pernicious and so forth. And let's, you would put back on her value. Yeah, I would. And I would say, well, I feel fully can appreciate how you feel. But honestly, if I felt that my husband is married to my dress, and the rest of me yeah. Yeah. You know, I would ask, is something wrong with me or with my husband? Like, I would reveal why I think that that approach doesn't make sense to me and understand that it's not making sense to me. Uh, sorry if this sounds kind of silly. Uh, I don't feel that this explanation about my, my husband would want me or like me more is uh, a very good explanation for it. I think in my area of medicine is if you look uh, close enough at all these values, all of them might have a good rationale. Because we hear, you know, my husband's going to leave me. But if you talk to a patient like Lynn, you might learn that it's very important for her to feel loved by a man who, with whom she has a long history and maybe her fears are unfounded, etc., etc. But people have good rationales. It's just we don't know deep enough to understand or even how they actually deserve. You know, again, sometimes maybe someone's raised alone or, you know, they have maternal fear, et cetera, et cetera. So the value they give to certain things is high enough that would be a reasonable thing that what they want actually makes sense. And on that, you know, obviously every case is complex and every case is its own case. What a philosopher can do is to try and purify the case to see what the conceptual issues are at stake. So I'm going to have to push back at you and say, there might be cases of the kind that you're describing. 
But what I am curious about is whether in a case where you fully help the patient to clarify what's going on and their own beliefs and values are, and at the end of that full clarification, you deeply believe <coughs> that her values are profoundly misguided and will have a consequence say, that she will refuse a life-saving intervention. Would it be part of your job as a doctor not merely to say, okay, here's what happens if you do this, here's what happens if you do that, thank you for helping enabling me to understand your thinking, but to go further and say, and by the way, let's talk about your thinking, because it seems to be based upon values that are highly problematic in the challenge. Is that part of your job description? When you say misguided, yeah. do you mean that they deviate from what most people do? No, I mean that you think they are wrong. Because you, really and you think you have good them. reasons for thinking they are wrong. That's what it is to think something's wrong, to think that you've got it, that you've got it right. And again, what I'm asking is, what's your job description? There's all this talk of shared decision making for the last couple of decades, and I'm asking, what goes into it? Mark, how much time do we have? Oh, Javon, I'm going to push off because there's, I want to get to my third question. What I was trying to say, if I were sitting behind my desk, I'm Cigar or wine in my hand, I'll write that sentence. But patients. Let me tell you, I philosophers don't sit with cigar <laughs> and wine, if only. When we become ill, we are not only physically ill, we are emotionally ill. We are a different person when we become ill. And the and what we call value, it could be fear. It would be a different issue. When we, and as a doctor, we have different duties. It's not only the respect what the person just believes, he says. We really have to find out what it is really mean. Now, if the person says, the only reason I don't want to have my breast removed because I'm the only one in my life, the husband doesn't like me, from my point of view, still. question I'm going to have is only for those of you who think that. For those of you who think that all that should be in the patient-doctor conversation is values clarification, the next question is not a question for you. It's only for those of you who think actually sometimes it's right to, it's proper to challenge the patient's values. Um, I was going to lead up to this third question with a discussion of an article by um, um, Ezekiel and Linda Emanuel. I don't need to do that. I'm going to go right to it. Um, once you open the door to saying you may challenge your patient's beliefs and values, now let's go back to our Jehovah's Witness. There you are. You're convinced that her beliefs are false. You might be convinced for any number of reasons. You might be an atheist and think there is no God, or you might be a a religious believer and think there's a God, but it's not the one that the witness has in hand. Or it might be that prior to going to medical school or nursing school or whatever, you did a PhD in um, the Torah. And you were a scholar of those parts of, I think it's Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that are the verses that are the basis, the textual, the biblical basis for the witness and refusal to accept blood products. And you know, because you wrote your dissertation on it, 
that that's the wrong reading of those biblical verses. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you know, forget whether these verses are in Hebrew, Iron Man, whichever it is, you know both. Um, and you know the witnesses have got it wrong. And now my question is, if you think it's okay to argue with the woman with breast cancer about her decision, do you also think it's okay to argue with the Jehovah's Witness? And if you think there's a distinction that is one with moral weight, so that you should argue in the first case, but not the second, I want to know what it is. And don't tell me religion is a matter of faith. That's a philosophical view. There have been religions that have been thought to be purely rational, sufficiently rational. Um, and so to rest things on that is itself to take a philosophical position. Um, so again, my point here is you've got at the bedside, these are philosophical decisions you have to make it all the time. So now tell me, for those, yeah, some of you might think all bets are off. You can go and wrestle with your Jehovah's Witness about anything. You're trying to save her life, just like you're trying to save the graduate student's life um, and the woman with cancer's life. But well, if some of you think, yes, push back on the values of the woman with breast cancer, but keep your mouth shut about your beliefs about the Jehovah's Witness, I want to know why the difference. Okay, do you want to know that on that? I was going to respond both to this question two and question three. I think the critical to the way you phrase question two is strong, right, in the sense that you're trying to sort of push past something that right. you want. And I, and, I, and I think the answer is strong is, is, you know, maybe over the edge. And I think the same answer works in the third in some sense. You could say something like, you know, you might be interested to know I actually study this. And there are, and there are other, other ways to think about this we would be interested in talking about. It's a much gentler way to do it, other than saying, you know, this is wrong. But at the end of the day, so I want to know what is. So, so I mean, is, is this a tactical point, which I would absolutely accept, or a substantive moral point? That it's okay to sort of gently say, do you want to talk? So, so the question is, can you have a philosophical conversation with a patient? Right. That's a minimum more basic way. Right. And I think where your goal is to change your patient's mind about something that's up. I think the answer is absolutely yes. You can have a physio. I'm not a physiologist. If I can have a physiological conversation, I would explain what I know and don't know about it and refer to other people as experts. If I have some substantive knowledge of philosophy, I don't see a reason why I shouldn't, you know, state that while stating the, the extent and limitations of my qualifications. And if you, if your dissertation, you did two dissertations, one, um, uh, he's a scholar who said to take on the Bible, the other is on atheism. You have know, all your know, arguments for being an atheist. Should you talk them out to, to the, the patient? Sure. I think you should offer them. Right. I mean, that's a whole thing to do. Others? Same way for the for the adult. 
this dilemma and it's actually pretty weird. Well, now I don't doubt, but of course, I'm, I'm not going to give a talk in which I say, here are the 80 techniques right. to avoid grappling with the philosophical. <laughs> no, I understand. Uh, my question is, once it's there, which way do you go? Substantive moral 
that only if you've reached the level of intimacy with the patient is it proper, not just likely to succeed, but actually morally proper to challenge the patient. Um, if you simply think that there is a thing called a doctor-patient relationship, it would be reduced to a tactical question. That is, that relationship is more or less the same kind of thing um, in different contexts. It has to be reflected in light of the realities of what that relationship would be like in different contexts. But then, as I said, well, it's not going to work in the hospital setting to challenge the values of people and other patients. Well, but the underlying thought then would be that if me that the Jehovah's Witness case is different from the meningitis case and the breast cancer case. Me too. How? I'll, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. In that we're talking about a lifelong belief system rather than an immediate unique circumstance that has just come up for the patient with meningitis or for the other patient with breast cancer. But, but, but this is a belief system. And it's not so much that it's a religious belief system, although this particular one was, but, but it's, it's a lifelong set of beliefs uh, which are now applied to a particular circumstance. Uh, but but it's, it's not as if the circumstance creates a, a new set of beliefs. Those have existed previously. So, so I, I mean, I, I rarely question one's religious convictions and beliefs uh, or, or, or the appropriateness of any religious uh, tradition. Um, but, but it's not only religion. I mean, there are other things that, that can lead to a lifelong system of, of ongoing belief. And, and that's why I think this case is different from the two early ones. Notice, so I wasn't going to jump in and both my own view, but Mark has more or less done so, but I want to sort of press other assumptions that have to go into what I take to be the view Mark's sketching. One could distinguish cases in which um, the clinician and the patient share the same values but rank them differently from cases in which the patient has fundamental life-guiding beliefs, religious or otherwise that the physician doesn't share. And you might think it's one thing 
to argue about the comparative ranking, say, of physical attractiveness. There's no reason that the oncologist can't think that physical sexual attractiveness isn't a good thing. An oncologist is just saying to that patient, you're giving it too much weight compared to prolonged life. Um, they're sharing values, and they, but they could be disagreeing about how to weight or rank. That might be thought to be different from the Jehovah's Witness case, in which you do have someone who has what I'm calling to have brought it to that's religion, a fundamental lifestyle and belief. But then, one wants to know, so what's wrong with challenging a fundamental lifestyle and belief? And here, I think, if there is something wrong with it, it would go to the institutional role of a physician. And to the fact that the physician has a kind of power. And more, that the physician is, even in the American system, in some ways, quasi-state agent, in the sense that they're licensed, um, a huge amount of revenue comes from this or that form of federal program, the toolbox comes from the NIH, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, you're not running a candy store. Um, and there is a principle of liberal political theory that says that state agents ought not to try and impose diverse pluralistic society on um, one or another run on fundamental life kind of belief. And that this and that insofar as the relationship with your patients um, is one of a certain kind of asymmetry and power, that's a relevant distinction and that might provide a reason to tread very, very lightly in one kind of place and less so. That's anyway my thought about how to separate those two classes of cases, bringing political philosophy, institutional roles. Thank you.